Well, good evening. What a great uh, and sweet time of prayer that was. Amen? Amen. Let me mention a couple of, of items. Um, Pastor Billy's going to go get some door hangers. Just so you know, we want to really promote Christmas Day. Um, I believe there are so many people in our community that right now have no intention of going to a church. But if we put it on their mind, they're going to go to the church that put it on their mind. And so uh, it's real easy, low-hanging fruit. Don't even have to knock on the door. I'd like for you to if you want, you know, and talk to them. But you don't even have to knock on the door. Just go door to door and put a door hanger on there, and they're going to have an invitation. Uh, so that if they're going to go anywhere on Christmas Day, they're thinking, you know, that church came to me with a flyer. I'm going to go there. And that way they'll be able to hear the gospel that day. And so I'm hoping, I'm hoping for many people to be here that day. Pray with me that many people will be here that have fallen out of fellowship with the church or never been to a church, um, that they'll be here on Christmas Day. Also, next Wednesday night, we won't be meeting in here. We'll be meeting in there, and we'll have a worship service. Um, we'll have music. Sing, we'll sing, worship through song, and then there'll be a preaching next Wednesday night at 6.30. There's no meal next Wednesday, so know that. There's just the worship service at 6.30. And then uh, the Wednesday after Christmas, we'll have our a one-week break, and then the first week of January, we'll, we'll be back meeting again, and we'll be starting with Second Thessalonians. So I'm looking forward to, to the second letter that Paul wrote to the same church in Thessalonica, uh, and we're going to be meeting here. Um, I don't know what you think about it, but I like it here. So um, if we, uh, yeah, if um, uh, the only thing that's going to move us would be a good thing, and that's because uh, we get too many to be in here. And that's a good thing. So although you, you might not want to be in here, we can shoot for that. But um, in here, we can hear each other easier. We can interact more, pray around tables, take notes easier, all of those things. And so uh, the plan is uh, Jan all of Second Thessalonians, the study, we have in plan to have it right here in the fellowship hall. And uh, Davis is going to move his orchestra practice into the worship center in January and February. So make plans uh, to be in here for every Wednesday night except next Wednesday night. Next Wednesday night, worship service in the sanctuary. All right? I do want to just testify, and if you can go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians 5 if you wish, and the outline's going to be on the back of the prayer sheet there. Uh, the last two nights have been tremendous. Uh, many of you know how great the musical was. You know how great light the night was the week before. The last two nights with our Christmas store has been tremendous as well. Um, there have been dozens of families come on this campus, sit down and eat a meal with members of this church that love Jesus, interacting with them, getting to know them and sharing the gospel with them. Then taking them into the gym to find the items that the church, many of you participate in that, the church bought for the kids. And so they shop and they get all these items. They go to a cashier just like they're at a real store. And, and it, it tallies up the gifts that's assigned to them. And they, so they don't pay anything, but they get what's in the categories of that price. And so they leave with the gifts. Then, but before they leave, after they pay, they go to um, have them wrapped. And we had a whole team of members there to to wrap the gifts with them and minister to them. And then they got the gifts got taken to their vehicle, put in the vehicle. All the while, the youth or the child or the preschooler has been over in those areas of the church for about an hour and a half where the pastors and directors and leaders have been pouring into them. So we had youth go to the youth area of this church for an hour and a half and spend time with the youth leaders and the youth pastor and hear the gospel. We had children go to the children's area. Uh, over in the children's area, I didn't ever make it up to the youth area. It might have been the same in the youth. But in the children's area, there was a place for refreshments. There was a room where they played and blew off steam and run and did, do whatever they wanted to do, okay, to pass time. And, and also there was a Bible story time gospel sharing time, and then there was a room where the kids pick out a little item and have it wrapped for their parents. So the kids also were participating in the Christmas store 
um, and they were having something they got to take home and put under their tree if they, if they have a tree. All right, and so home run all the way around. 87 children, uh, their Christmases, the Christmas gifts were purchased for them. And so church, I want to say thank you. If you weren't here the last two nights, if you participated in buying them, you participated in a part of it. If you participated in praying for them to hear the gospel and be saved, you participated in a part of it. If you served in any part of it, which we had two nights of it, it was, it was awesome for me to see the people of God ministering to people. And I just want to say that's a drastic improvement from what we were doing a few years ago. A few years ago, I took a bag of gifts due to the graciousness of the church to buy them. But I knocked on the door. I said, here's your Christmas that's been provided to you by First Baptist Millington. They said, thank you. They would take them in. Have a good day. Okay, now that's a good thing, but that's not near as productive as what we just did the last two nights, where they're coming on campus for an hour and a half. I shared the gospel with two men last night, 15 minutes apiece. They were not moving away from me. They were not distancing from me. They were not trying to get away. They were not in a hurry. I, end, I started and I ended the conversation when we were done. And that's wonderful. I rarely get that. Okay? Normally, uh, they're running. Okay? Uh, they, they know, all right, all right, all right, preacher, all right, preacher. Um, but they, they were engaging with eye contact. They were listening intently. Uh, one professed to know the Lord. The other one acknowledged that he didn't. And he said that uh, I need to do that, but he did not repent and believe and become saved. So Nick is him, his name, if you want to pray for Nick. The other one was Nikita. Nikita professes to know the Lord. Nick knows that he doesn't know the Lord as Lord and Savior at this time. All right. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I, I will tell you, just... To keep rambling, a great story. One, one of the kids, when they got here, uh, youth age actually, a teenager, in the first two minutes of talking to Darian Field, our uh, youth intern, um, said, what is baptism? First two minutes, what is baptism? I've never, I've never been to church before. I, I've heard that word. I don't know what that means. What is baptism? Well, Darian thought she was going to have to bond and, get to know the girl, and then try to break the... I mean, the girl went right into baptism. Well, that goes right into the gospel because baptism is a picture of the gospel. And so two minutes in, it was already the, the, the young lady was asking for the gospel to be explained. Praise God. Right here on the church campus, when we say we'd love to have you worship with us, they know where to go. They're all, they've already been here. It's not like we're at their house trying to explain... Yeah, it's the one over there by KFC. It's not, which one is it? You know, I get asked that all the time. Which one is it? Where is it at? You think everybody would know where we're at. They don't. They drive by, but they don't, they don't pay attention. And so, um, anyways, it was, it was tremendous. Church, thank you. And I hope next year we can help over 100 children. Um, and this, this just grows and grows and grows. So we got three big events um, each Christmas season, all three have been such a blessing to me between Light the Night out on the lawn and sharing the gospel through the, the drama to the musical. Um, our choir and orchestra and media team were tremendous, amen? It was just tremendous. And then, and then the Christmas store of meeting the needs of families financially, but also meeting their need in, spiritually as well. All right, well, I hadn't gotten started yet. I better, okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 23 through 28 tonight, and so this is the last lesson in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and when you think of these books, you need to think of a letter. Paul is, is having people write down as he speaks, inspired of God, they're pinning this letter and they're sending it off. Um, they're, they're having someone take it to the city of Thessalonica to say, here, this is a letter from the Apostle Paul giving you instructions in the Lord. Okay, and so that's, that's the picture here. It's a letter from a man that cares for them, loves them deeply, inspired of God to write. So what do you say in your closing words? Do you encourage them? Do you give them a charge? 
and your final statement to them? Well, Paul kind of tries to do both here. He concludes with what God does for his children. Then he exhorts the Thessalonians to press on in the faith. And so the title of the message tonight is a, a word of blessing and a closing plea to them. All right, so let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 23 through 28 at this time. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So number one, what God does for his own. What does he do for his people? What does he do for the born again Christian? First, he sanctifies. It says in verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you Entirely. Paul's writing as a Christian to a church of Christians, obviously. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Now let's talk about this phrase, God of peace, first. Oftentimes when we hear God, God of peace, we think of no war. All right? Uh, in fact, on the night of Christ's birth, um, peace on earth, goodwill to men... We, oftentimes people will make that into a Christmas card that, you know, peace throughout the world, world peace. It has nothing to do with world peace. Uh, the Lord Jesus did not come into the world to bring world peace. He came to bring peace to your soul. When he saves you, he grants you his peace that passes all understanding. The peace of God comes over you. And so the peace is internal peace, spiritual peace. And here, that's what it's talking about here. May the God of peace himself sanctify you. He's the one that's given you peace within your soul. He is the one that sanctifies you. Now, sanctification speaks of the spiritual maturing process. When you hear the word justification... That is a legal term where God saved you. He declared you justified. He de declared you innocent. You're not innocent, but he declares you that way because your sin got placed on Jesus. And so when God the Father looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Jesus who took your place, your substitute. Now, that's good stuff. Amen. And therefore, you're declared justified. So that happens when you're saved. If you're saved, you've been justified sanctification speaks of, in one sense, what he's done. He's made you pure, but it also speaks of what he's doing and what he will do. Here, he's wording it in a way of what he's done. Yet, the sanctification process is a process. That's why he says, sanctify you entirely. That word entirely is giving the impression of, you're sanctified because you're a child of God, but may he sanctify you entirely. In other words, may you mature in the faith. May you become more and more holy. May you know him more and more intimately. May you walk in holiness to a degree that you have not known before. May he sanctify you entirely. C.S. Lewis wrote the following about the issue of sanctification. C.S. Lewis is the same one that uh, chronicles a Narnia guy, okay, if you know that. Lewis wrote, when I was a child, I often had a toothache, and I knew that if I went to my mother, she would give me something which would deaden the pain for that night and let me get to sleep. But I did not go to my mother, at least not till the pain became very bad. And the reason I did not go was this. I did not doubt that she would give me the aspirin or whatever I needed to make me feel better, but I also knew that she would take me to the dentist the next day. I could not get what I wanted without her getting me something more that I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from the pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists. I knew they would start fiddling around with all sorts of other teeth, which had not begun to ache. Our Lord, he writes, is like a dentist. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some particular problem. Well, he will cure it all right, but he will not stop there. 
That may be all you asked for, but if you once have called on him, he gives you the full treatment. The Lord wants to not just fiddle with a part of you, he wants all of you. That's what it means when you confess him as Lord. He becomes the boss of all of your life. He writes, he wishes to transform you from the inside out, end quote. That's what it means to sanctify entirely. When, he, when Paul writes that, what he's saying is, is if you've got to go through a hard time where God's got to fiddle with the tooth, so to speak, so be it. He's in the business of confining, refining you and making you as holy as a saved sinner can be. Sometimes those aren't, that's not fun. I think of Hebrews 12 where it says those whom he loves, he disciplines. Part of the sanctifying process is God purifying us and therefore burning away the dross, the sin in our lives, cleansing us and making us holy. That's not a fun process all the time, but that is the process of God sanctifying you. God wants you. He loves you. So, uh, Max Lucado wrote this. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Now, that's not a biblical quote. That's a man's quote, but it sounds good to me. He cares for you. He, he, he loves you. And you might want to stay just the way you are, but he does not want that for you. He wants you to to go deeper with them. He wants you to mature. He wants you to care about sins that right now aren't too serious to you. The closer you get to the Lord, the more the, you get convicted about your thought life, about simple things that used to not bother you. They bother you now because you're closer, you're more intimate and holy with the Lord. That's sanctification. He wants to sanctify you entirely. Number two, he preserves. To sanctify entirely is to preserve completely. Verse 23, second part. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. So let's talk about this body, soul, spirit. All right? There are trichotomists that believe the body and the soul and the spirit are all three distinct. Let me share with you about Bill Burnett. He's a trichotomist. And he says the spirit is the dimension of man which deals with the spiritual realm, the part of man that knows God. It is the area that deals with faith, hope, reverence, prayer, and worship. He says the soul is the dimension of man which deals with the mental realm. It is the man's intellect, sensibilities, and will. This is the part that reasons and thinks and where your will has been changed in salvation. He says, I found that translation substitute soul for person in multiple places therefore the soul refers to the person the mental intellect the will he says the body is the dimension of man that deals with the physical realm this is the house in which we live now i share that with you and i don't know that i agree with every single thing i just read to you but i don't know that i disagree with it either okay it is very very hard to clearly define the difference in the spirit and the soul. But we're going to look at it for the next few minutes. I'm going to help you with it. We're going to go deeper with it than me simply making that statement. But when we get done, it's still not going to be crystal clear. Okay? Michael Martin is not a trichotomist. He's a dichotomist. He kind of sees that the soul and the spirit are really synonyms, at least most of the time. And he writes... He wrote the New American Commentary on 1 Thessalonians, and he writes, Paul was not describing the human person as a three-part conglomerate, but as a being with material and non-material existence who may or may not be spiritually enlivened in relation to God. So I've given you one that's a trichotomist, one's a dichotomist. I believe there is a difference in the soul and the spirit, for they are listed separately. That's one reason I believe it. All three are listed right here, okay? And I'm going to share with you some other verses that argue that they are different. Your body is the outer shell. What you're looking at is my body. My body is not going to heaven. What you're looking at right now is not going to heaven. Jesus did not die on the cross for my body to go to heaven. My body is going to return to dust. My soul, my spirit is what you cannot see. That is who I am. That's who, I, that's who will live forever 
in heaven or hell. And because I'm born again, saved by the grace of God, it's going to be heaven. Okay? All right? But everybody's soul or spirit's going to heaven or hell. So, notice, as I explained that, I didn't separate where the soul and spirit go. Okay? So let's look at some scriptures. I see some people looking at me very puzzled, so I better get to some scriptures. James chapter 1, verse 21. And you can write these references down uh, as we go through them and, and review them later. Feel free to do so. I want you to do so. It says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your what? Souls. So all of us need Jesus to save our souls. When we're, when we're growing up in this world as lost people, we need Jesus to save our soul. And he is able to do so according to James 1 and 22, 121. Excuse me. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So our, ro- our souls can be... In unrest or in rest, because it says you'll find rest, meaning that you don't automatically have rest for your soul. Are y'all with me on that? You find it through Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, so then those who had received the word were baptized, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. Okay? Well, what were they? They were 3,000 people. But the word used for people here is souls. At Pentecost, Peter preached, 3,000 people believed, and they were saved, and he refers to them as 3,000 souls. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So again, a reference to the soul and a clear distinction between soul and body. In John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Every human being has been born of the body, right? Been born of water, physically born, has a body. But not everyone's been born of the Spirit. That's the second birth. That's the rebirth. That's why we call it being born again. And you must be born spiritually to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. So there we see flesh and spirit in contrast. You're born physically, you must be born again spiritually in order to enter the kingdom of God. Now in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, a verse we often quote in referencing the Bible and the authority of God's word, it references the soul and spirit, which is the complicated part. It says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of what? Soul and spirit. Of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so, the soul and spirit are distinct And the word of God can pierce your soul and spirit so deeply. God can pierce you so deeply with his truth to the division of the soul and spirit. And the emphasis here is that's very deep. And that's why it's hard to to explain the difference in soul and spirit. I can do it to some degree, and I'm going to continue to try to do it right now. Um, But they are, sometimes they seem to be used interchangeably. All right, so Jesus died on the cross to save your soul. And he made you alive spiritually. So you are now, if you're a Christian, you are a spiritual being. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's made you alive. That's talking about spiritually he's made you alive unto Christ. So that's talking about your spirit. So you are body, soul, and spirit spirit and your body is your outer tent that you will leave that's what happens to be absent from the bodies to be where at home with the lord you go home your body's not going 
because your body is of this world. It's, 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 it's a body that is failing and aging due to sin in the broken world we live in. One day, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, your body will be raised and your mortal body will take on immortality. The perishable will put on imperishable. And you'll receive a glorified body that will unite with your soul and spirit in the future. So if I want to really walk your minds right now, and some of you are saying you lost me 10 minutes ago. Um, when you think of heaven in time, people ask me all the time, what do you think they're doing up there? Do you think they're dancing? Do you think they're running on the streets of gold? Heaven has times. But in heaven, God doesn't work by time. But to us, we are bound by time. And the new heaven and the new Jerusalem, when you read about the streets of gold, that's in the end of Revelation. That's, that hasn't happened yet. So when you think of heaven in the time in which we are bound right now, that's not happening yet. They're not walking the streets of gold. That's the future heaven. That's the new heaven, new Jerusalem. By the way, this isn't in 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm chasing something here. I'm chasing something here. I normally don't chase, but I'm chasing. All right? And the rabbit's quick. But um, uh, so the soul, all right, so just take my grandmother. My grandmother knew the Lord Jesus. My grandmother's body went in the ground. My grandmother's soul and spirit went on to be with the Lord. So in heaven right now, my grandmother doesn't have a physical body in how the Bible has explained it to us. So she's not really dancing or running or, or anything like that right now but one day she's going to receive a resurrected body that's going to unite with her soul and spirit she's going to be able to walk the streets of gold Amen. you see Amen. but if you look at it from the heaven side God's not in time so he doesn't work on past present future but we do while we're here on earth so I'm trying to explain it from the earth side of things and if you're if you didn't get that it's okay <laughs> God wants to sanctify us entirely and preserve us completely. Amen? Amen? All right. So I've gone over the verses on soul, spirit, because in this text it talks about body, soul, and spirit. I am a trichotomist. I think there is a, a slight distinction between the spirit and the soul. Okay? Um, let's go to verse 24 now of our text. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. All right, so let's, let's back up so we get what verse 24 is talking about. Verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame when? At the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are alive at the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, may, may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. So right there he is saying God, God cares about your body as long as you're bound to it. May we take care of our bodies. Yes, um, we all are going to breathe our last if, if he doesn't return in our lifetime, but we can do things to be good stewards of the body and our soul and our spirit. May we care for our soul and spirit. And you do that by spending time with the Lord, by walking in obedience to the Lord. That's how you care for your, your spiritual well-being. All right, and may we be sanctified entirely and preserved completely. All that's saying is, is Paul wants them to be as holy as safe sinners can be. That's what he's saying. May you strive to, to be holy in God's sight because faithful is he who calls you. He is worthy of you walking in holiness. He is worthy of you submitting to his authority over you. He is worthy. He is faithful as he calls you. And he will bring this to pass. He's watching over you. He's, Paul is using this as a word of encouragement to the Thessalonians. God is watching over you and he is sanctifying you. And he, will, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He is sanctifying you. He's writing it to the church to encourage them. So may it be an encouraging message to you and I that regardless of what you're going through, he is in the sanctification business. He is at work in and through you. And he is preserving you. He is faithful. Let's go to number two now. Three closing expectations. Let me look at the, yeah, 
I've made it halfway down the sheet in the first 20 minutes. Okay. Um, I chased a rabbit. All right. Uh, number two, three closing expectations. The first one is pray for others. Verse 25, Paul says, brethren, pray for us. He, he begins the letter by saying, I pray for you and I give thanks to God for you, church of Thessalonica. And now he's saying to the church, pray for us. We're in harm's way. We are risking our lives. We are planting churches. We're winning people to Jesus. We're discipling the saved. We're training up pastors. Pray for us. The persecution and the challenges are great. Pray for us is in the Greek present tense. And all that means is he wants ongoing prayer. He's not saying, hey, on Tuesday, will you please take time to, take, to pray for us one time. He's saying, please pray for us day after day after day after day. Be continual in the prayer. All right? So Paul understood the need for people praying for him, and he asked the church to do so. Billy Graham was once speaking to a group of pastors, and uh, I don't know what happened before it, but basically the setting is, is that the pastors were really down and out. So it might have been a group of pastors that were there where they might have um, had to leave the church due to pressure or they chose to or they were between churches or they, were, they just felt like they weren't being productive. But he said, here's the difference between you and me, men. The difference between you and me is not our preaching. Billy Graham said this. It's not our preaching. It's that I have people all over the world that pray for me every day. What a powerful statement from a man that could have lived off of, a, of an ego but was humble realizing I speak to 60,000 people in a baseball stadium because people are praying for me and God's hearing and blessing. He didn't take credit for it. He gave God the credit for answering prayers of people. And what he was also saying is, you pastors that are hurting, you don't, you don't have all those people praying for you. And so I want to I thank you, church, because I know and I believe that you pray for me. And my success or failure as a pastor, in one sense, is simply by whether I am faithful to the Lord. But the fruitfulness of the ministry many times is directly correlated to the prayers of the people. A church can be struggling and declining and the pastor be faithful, but the people aren't praying. And when the pastor's having to put out fires left and right, no one is there lifting him up to the Lord. So thank you for praying for me. And please don't ever think that FBC Millington is doing so well that you can slack in praying. I truly believe that God has granted me some favor here. He called me here, and he's shown some favor and allowed us to see some fruitfulness since I've been here. And I believe it's because he is a faithful God that answers the prayers of his people. Amen. So the future of the church is dependent. In one sense, God can do what he wants, in spite, whether we pray or not. Let's be honest, he can do that. But he delights in answering the prayers of of those who are persistent. We learn that in Luke 18, the lady, uh, the parable of the lady that prayed persistently, so the judge gave her what she wanted. And God delights in hearing us say, God, watch over our pastor and the pastoral staff, bless them in their efforts, guide their steps, give them the words to say, protect their minds and hearts, feed their souls that they can feed us. Every week, if you pray for me to feed you, I'll tell you what, I'll be a very effective preacher. Amen. And every week, if you want me to die while I'm on the stage because you hate my guts, <laughs> probably I'm not going to be a very good preacher to you. It's amazing how one's ex... That was pretty... But <laughs> that's not in my notes either. Um, I was just trying to be bold about it. But the point is, if you 
hate me and want me to suffer and all that, then you're probably not going to grow in your faith under my preaching. It's a matter of attitude and perspective. So when I don't make a decision, when I make a decision you might not like guiding the church or something, you can still love me, you can still pray for me, you can still ask God to prepare your heart to be fed, and God can still use me in your life. Okay? All right. Number two, greet one another. Verse 26. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. It's already 7.30. All right. Y'all ready to listen quick? Here we go. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Now, the brethren are fellow Christians. So greet fellow Christians with a holy kiss. Now, we don't do the holy kiss in our culture. We do the holy hugs and handshakes, okay? But in the first century over in the Middle East, they did greeting with the holy kiss. And if you're wondering what that was like, that was men kissing men and women kissing women. It wasn't, it wasn't men kissing women. But if you're thinking it was just on the cheek, no, it was not always just on the cheek. <laughs> so real quick, i got to tell a story. We're running late. Are y'all fine? Are y'all in a hurry? Uh, if you got to go get your kids in nursery, I understand or something, but uh, I was in Russia. And in Russia, uh, I spoke to a, at a community center to about 200 people. And afterwards, they wanted to meet the Americans. This was back in 2001. You know, communism ended like 88, 89, something like that there. And so uh, they wanted to meet the Americans. In this village, they had never met an American. And so we share the gospel, and they form a line. And uh, I go ahead and... When you go into their culture, you're supposed to follow their customs, okay? You're on their turf, and they, 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 they kiss. And um, so I just, I just decided, I was like 23, 24, I just said, I, I'm just going to impose my way and break the rules. And so I just put my hand out and go ahead and get that, you know. <laughs> and uh, I did that about 150 times, and I, I, I saw this one. I saw this man about two or three away. And he was staring at me. And I could not read. I couldn't read if I was attractive to him or he just admired me because I just spoke. I couldn't, I couldn't read the difference. He was just staring at me, and I was uncomfortable. And so when he gets up to me, he watched the ones in front. He, knows, he knew that no one else had kissed me, but he leaned in. And he didn't lean in for my cheek. He leaned in for my lips. And I turned, shook his hand, and he kissed me right there. And when I drew back, and this is funny, but it's not funny anymore. When I drew back, I realized I had devastated him. Um, I was too cool to do it their way, which I still struggle with. <laughs> but he wanted to greet me with a holy kiss. And... I just talked about the love of Christ, and I rejected him. I, it was basically like him sticking out his hand and me doing this. And he, he almost started crying. I mean, I, his face was like, how rude and insulting can you be to me? I thought you were about love. I mean, that's how I read his face anyways. You've got to realize I can't understand any Russian. So I don't, you know, we're really not saying a word. It's just embracing so they still do this holy kiss in other parts of the world. And my story didn't have much to do with anything other than it said holy kiss. Um, and that's, every time I read holy kiss in scripture, I think of what happened to me. Um, same thing with uh, Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss. Every time I read that text, I, I think I betrayed him uh, when he tried to kiss me. You know. Um, all right, number three and last, read the word of God. Verse 27, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. So when it says have it read to all the brethren, is it that this letter came to the leaders and they wanted it read to the church or do they want it to spread to other churches? It's both. They wanted this letter read when they gather together. They got one copy. They unroll it and they read 1 Thessalonians, this letter, entirely with no verses or anything. Just read it as a letter to the congregation. 
And then they want to start making some copies of it and sending it to other churches. So all the brethren, so it spreads and all the brethren can read it. And now we are part of that brethren. We are now reading it and benefiting from the letter to the Thessalonians. And so both was fulfilled. Verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul regularly referenced grace. Grace is what you do not deserve. If it's what you deserve, it's not grace. That's justice. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve, and that's what you have when you know Jesus. What you don't deserve. You've been forgiven. You don't deserve it. You've been saved. You don't deserve it. And he says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. What he's saying is, the grace that saved you, the grace you've experienced as a Christian, may you now show that grace to others. May that grace be with you as you go, as you live your life. And that's the closing, that's the closing words he has for us. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you and me and one another. May we be known for grace. Especially, well, not especially. May we be known for grace with lost people that don't know Jesus and therefore don't know better. May we be people of grace with the saved because though we are saved, we are not perfect. May we show grace to one another. May we grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and demonstrate love one to another. So if you ever go to Russia, show grace and don't do what I did. But if I had done that, I'd have to tell you I got kissed by a man. Let us be people of grace. Amen? I love y'all. I hope you've had fun tonight. But let's take the truth of this text. If you need to read through it again, read through it again. Sanctify you entirely. Preserve you completely. That's, that's what God wants to do in your life. Let him do a great work in your life. And may you grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the letter of 1 Thessalonians. And Lord God, I pray that you would teach us and mold us and shape us and lead us to be people of grace one to another. Lead us to pray for one another and to greet one another with love and respect and with grace. Thank you for being gracious to us, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.